Now I want to show you another way to think about the relationship between forces and energies. So one thing we know is what we've done so far is we calculated these potential energies, gravitational and spring, by calculating the external work. Right? We said that the delta U is the integral of some external work, F dot dr. We really didn't have a fundamental formula for the potential energy. It came directly from this. We put in the force related to the interaction, spring or gravity, and we did the integral. We either got mgh or we got 1 half kx squared. And this formula makes sense. If you have an external agent doing work, it's going to increase the energy because it brings in energy from the external environment. You could also write it like this then. You could say it's equal to minus the integral if you have an internal force dot dr. So this is a way to just think about the system in and of itself without thinking of an external agent. So let's do it real quick for the spring. So let's say we had a one-dimensional spring sitting here, and this is its natural length at zero. We could push it this way. And what would happen if we push it this way? Then we would have an R that way, and the spring force, the internal spring force pushing on the mass would be that way, F spring. And if we displace it over here, if we would displace it, R would be that way, and the spring would pull it back. All right, the spring force would be that way. So sure enough, this also makes sense. They're the opposite directions. The dot products will come out negative, and that negative, and that negative, and you'll get that U is, is positive. The U increases. The potential energy in the spring increases when we pull it this way, and it increases when we push it that way. In fact, you could even make a plot of uh, the spring potential as a function of this, this axis, right? So if this is x, and this is x, and this is 0, you'd get the 1 half kx squared. It'd be positive on either side. So you could plot it like that. And that would be the energy. So the potential energy. We can get something else from this, though. We can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. Mental theorem of, I'll try to write all fancy. That didn't go well, OK. So if we apply the fundamental theorem of my calculus, we know uh, if the difference in this function is the integral of its derivative over a region, then you can flip it around and say that the derivative of the f that we're looking for, uh, we'll do one dimension here, f in the x direction, is minus du dx. Right? In this case, we'll put s's. Right? The minus derivative, spatial derivative, of the spring energy is equal to the force of the spring. All we've done is apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, and we kept the negative sign along for the ride. And you can kind of see that this makes sense. All we got to do is say, OK, what if we're right here in this state? What is uh, the slope du dx? It's positive. All right. This says you take that slope positive, make it negative, and that's the direction of the force. So that means the force would be this way. And sure enough, pull the mass out, the force is that way. If you come over here, way back here, or shove the mass all the way to here, du dx is negative, but you stick a negative sign in front, so the force would be positive direction. And sure enough, force is in the positive direction. And it's not just the direction, you actually get the right magnitude. If you were to actually work it out, 1 half kx squared uh, minus d dx of 1 half kx squared, right, that's us. What do you get? 2 times a half is 1, kx, you get minus kx. And sure enough, that is the Hooke's Law um, force. But this is the general way to get a force from a conserved potential. And in physics, then, if we're going to think about a mass on a spring, we don't actually think about plotting the force. That would be weird. We always plot this. We always think in terms of energies and plot energy. An example could be, what if we wanted to think about a vertically hanging spring? Right, here's a vertical spring where we want to have to deal with, oh, we've got to deal with both the spring potential energy and the gravitational potential energy at the same time. Right, that can be done in terms of kinematics, but here's how you could do it in terms of energy. You could say, let's look at the gravitational potential energy. Surely that's not right. Okay, so that would look like this. Let's see, U, G as you move up and down. So we're going to make up and down this axis because this axis is u. 
right? And we're doing a spring with a mass on it this way, where uh, this is the y-axis. Right? So we're thinking about the spring moving up and down to y, but we're plotting y this way. OK, what does the potential energy do, the gravitational potential energy do? As you move up and down, it's just linear, right? mgy. So it looks like this, right? If you call this 0, it can go negative if you move below what you would call 0. Okay. Let's look at the spring. Yes, spring we just did. It looks like this. If we're talking about y, compressing the spring up and down, and we wanted to plot us, it would look like what we just drew, like that. A little spring potential. And we can check it. Let's see, if we go to here, we got this, the gravitational force. We could say F is minus du dx. The slope here is negative, right? So let's see, this is going to positive y, right? Right, so the slope uh, here, I'm sorry, the slope here is positive. Right? The slope is positive. Minus du dx is going to give you a force negative, a force down. Yes, the gravitational force is down. Anywhere you go, the slope is positive, therefore the force is down. Makes sense. This works for the spring, just like we showed a minute ago. So the question is, what happens when you have a mass here, the spring's at its natural length, and you turn on gravity? It falls a little bit, and it reaches a new equilibrium position, where it's the length of the spring plus a kx force equal to the mg force. You've got to cancel the spring gravitational force. But you still end up at sort of a minimum. So the way you would get that in physics is you just add these two potentials. Do it on a computer. Just add a negative slope line with a kx squared uh, polynomial. And it's going to look kind of like this. Hopefully I can draw it well. If we do ug plus us, it's going to kind of, I think my artistry will work here. The key is that this uh, was 0, so it's going to kind of do this. Oh my god. <laughs> wow. That was really bad. Well, it started out really well, right? And then, yeah, it's going to kind of do that. So this potential really just shifts down and to the left. And the new minimum where it wants to sit, the new place where the force is 0, the force is 0 because du dx is 0, is lower. Right? We've gone to further to negative y, where this is plus y. And that's what would happen. If you suddenly turn on gravity, it would go lower. And it would still be a potential well that looks like a spring, and it would still oscillate up and down and everything. So in physics, we often think of them more like this. We think in terms of potential energy. I can give you another example, getting into something somewhat research-related. If you have little uh, particles in solution, little nanoparticles or colloids, they're often stabilized through electrostatic forces. Right? So if you have a positively charged particle and an identical particle, so its surface chemistry makes it positively charged, uh, that will keep them stable because all particles are attracted, right? So they'll feel a van der Waals force basically as the force of the little dipole moments fluctuating and the dipoles attract each other. You get a little dipole moment fluctuation in this one creates a, an attractive dipole moment in this one. So that's called the van der Waals force. Everything is attracted by, by this interaction. But then you also have uh, a repelling electrostatic force like that because like charges repel. It's actually screened. It's not the one you would calculate uh, in electrostatics, but it's still repul repulsive even though it's screened by ions. So very complicated system, but how do we study it? In physics, we just think about the potentials, right? So we could plot um, the two potentials. They both come down very fast. So if this is the separation between the surfaces of the particles here, like that, D, so this is when they're touching. You don't want them to touch. This is when they're far apart. Then the van der Waals looks like this. It comes down really fast like that. And the electrostatic, right, because they want to be far apart, it's hard to bring them together. I'm sorry, the, I'm sorry, this is electrostatic. This is UE, right? They don't want to be close together. They want to be far apart. And the van der Waals wants to bring them close together. So that's that one, like that. But these two things have different scales for their decay. So when you put them together, it looks like this. The energy comes down like that. And you get a minimum here at some separation. So this is U uh, van der Waals plus U electrostatic. <coughs> you, you add those two potentials, and you say they have an average separation of d naught. Therefore, they don't collide, they don't collapse, they don't aggregate with each other. They all sit about d naught apart. So this is how we usually think about forces and interactions 
in you know, physics research world.